This is called uh, Facing the Public, an Editorial Perspective. And our topics today, uh, three topics, new disorders to treat, new doctors to reach, and new ways to pay. And these are things we touched on yesterday during our sessions, some of, uh, many of the sessions. And we're gonna open it up by uh, asking each of our panelists, um, the way it works here, just to go over the rules. We're gonna do uh, 15 minutes on each topic, actually a little bit less since we started late. So call it 10 minutes on each of the three topics. And then we're gonna do an unmoderated <laughs> discussion. Uh, but the rule is nobody speaks for more than 60 seconds. And then when the buzzer sounds, we switch topics. So Laden, can you be our buzzer? All right. Let's see how much time we have. Yeah, give us 10 minutes. Okay, so those are the rules. Well, we're the panelists, but remember, we're all participating. So let's start with new disorders to, to treat. And, and Jeremy, I'm going to pose the first question to you. Uh, are neurotech startups wise to look at new indications unserved by pharma uh, and, and uh, med tech companies, or would they be better off developing novel therapies for existing indications? From your experience and during all of your yeah. presentations, you like to remind us all of your deep experience touching how many, how many neurotech companies have you touched? <laughs> At least two. Okay, at least two. I think it's been more than that. So from your experience as a neurotech consultant and also as a, you know, an executive at several of these firms, uh, what do you, what would be your advice for uh, startups? What's, what's a better approach? It's not a straight answer because it really depends and it depends on numbers of factors and a lot has to do with uh, timeline, has to do with funding, uh, has to do with uh, clinical risk. And so, you know, back in the days when I was uh, with Alman Companies, you know, there was no issues of fundings or, you know, we have, uh, you know, the chairman of uh, uh, the Alman Foundation here where the timelines are, are much longer. So, you know, new indications can take longer timelines, uh, lines have higher risk, uh, require more cash, uh, but uh, gr greater rewards if you're able to get it. I mean, whoever cracks uh, the code for neuromodulation for Alzheimer's, you know, that's going to be a, a blockbuster. But, you know, there's been a lot of money thrown in there. And uh, so, you know, that, that's a challenge. If it's an existing one and uh, easier pathway and clinically regulator, uh, regulator but the, the, the valuations may be uh, less at the end of the day. All right. So you're kind of hedging a little bit. Um, I bet JoJo's probably not going to hedge as much. What's your what's your viewpoint, Jojo? I think there's sort of an altruistic version of this, which in my heart I want to say the whole field is going to advance uh, and have a significant win if we can get an indication where our solution is a first line therapy. And so, if you want to be really kind and and charitable, then go for an indication that doesn't have a strong pharma component, so that the rest of the field can win. I understand that's not a great business case for an individual startup, um, <clears throat> but then again, take one for the team, please. Um, in terms of, of being focused on a single company, I, I would still stay with an underserved population because it's less crowded. And if you really have an efficacious um, therapy, then you're going to stand apart and you have to spend a little bit more on your healthcare economics case. Um, but if there's no other solution, then the economics should speak for themselves. Okay. So I'll throw my two cents in, uh, kind of follow it. I'm, yeah, I get 60 seconds. Uh, I'm, I'm asking for five additional seconds because of the interruption now. Okay. So, so just following up on what both of you guys said, um, yeah, I get it that, uh, that there's trade-offs one way or the other, and I appreciate uh, Jojo, that yeah, there can be altruistic, and and, and in fact, we, we shouldn't dismiss that out of hand because a lot of startups that uh, I've seen, in fact, a couple that are presenting here today, uh, have been founded because the founder or the founder's family member had a particular disease or disorder that they really wanted uh, addressed, and they didn't feel it was being adequately addressed. We're going to hear from at least one, probably two or three. Uh, um, founders uh, who fit that profile. So I don't want to dismiss what you said, um, um, Jojo. I think that's important. But you know, also uh, as 
industry observers and reporters that we are over the years, we've covered many neurotech startups who've tried both approaches. All right, let's come out the door with one therapy that will be our, you know, uh, our lead. But in the pipeline, we've got this new indication that's never, uh, all right. Uh, Jeremy, you want to follow up on what I just said? Well, we haven't talked about, you know, you know, I, I come from a very practical perspective, particularly having an early stage startup where if you don't have the funding, you don't have a company. Uh, you know, so, you know, in terms of having, you know, family foundations are great, you know, for more altruistic uh, ventures and, you know, if you have longer timelines um, <clears throat> or, you know, um, but, uh, you know, you have to see from a practical perspective, you know, funding, clinical, regulatory, uh, reimbursement. And those are just, uh, you know, critical considerations from a, a practical perspective. Okay. Jojo, your follow-up? I, th I think I'll, I'll double down on, on saying go for an underserved non-pharma solution um, indication because you're going to have so many more champions behind you. I mean, if you look at pain, pain is a huge motivator. And anybody who's suffering from a chronic pain will do almost anything to be rid of it. And that's something that we focus on a lot because there are some, there are a lot of opportunities in pain within neuromodulation, neurotechnology. Patient populations with other indications are no less desperate, especially if they don't have other things to try first. If they're just told by the doctor, sorry, go live with it or go die from it, that's that's not a... a a workable, viable solution for them and their family. So I think in addition to the extra work that you're going to have to do to prove your economic case and raise funds, um, that the, the support once it's rallied will be strong and unwavering. Okay. And I'm going to follow up um, uh, on what you just said. And, and actually, I follow up on a comment that Marcus made yesterday during your, your session, which I thought was particularly poignant. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure it was SCI that there was 9,000 people on a waiting list to get into a clinical trial. Was that, was that Marcus who made that comment? Um, for I think it was our, our and one of our, the last panel, I believe, that oh, mentioned that on Marco. Onward. Yeah. It was Marco who made Marco that. Marco made that. And yes. it's a long waiting list. Marco, Marcus. You know. for, 16, <laughs> for 16 slots, I think, that were open. Yeah, there are thousands of people. And guess what? Uh, I think, Bob, you can share this perspective when you all were were um, commercializing the Argus uh, implant. Um, I'm sure there was a long waiting list of blind people who wanted to get into uh, a clinical trial. So that argues for what you were saying that, yeah, if you have this altruistic motive where you're trying to serve a population of people who are desperate, who are willing to do anything, we're going to hear. All right, I'll finish that thought later. <laughs> Jeremy, you're, 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 you have the floor. But I, I want to bring up, uh, you mentioned Argus, and, you know, Second Sight is a wonderful story where, you know, from start, you know, from inception to uh, commercialization was 20 years, right? And, uh, you know, I don't know what the investment was, one to $200 million, I'm guessing. And it made such huge contributions to the field, but perhaps not particularly successful commercially, uh, but, you know, there's a wonderful example of, you know, our man funding and others that uh, whole endeavor uh, and getting in the direction where, you know, I'm convinced eventually it's going to happen, just like cochlear implants when it first started, you know, work very modestly. And today, you know, you can't tell someone has a, uh, is completely deaf on the phone with a cochlear implant. So uh, I think that's a wonderful example in terms of second sight and making contributions. But if you're you know, the entre entrepreneur behind it, it's, it's a tough sell. Yeah. I'm actually going to go back over to Victor's comment yesterday about the Iran's law and <laughs> the cost of pharmaceuticals doubling or developing a pharmaceutical doubling what every nine years, I think you said, Victor, that um, this is going to behoove pharma to jump in maybe on our side of the fence and look at if they haven't been able to develop a drug for a therapy over all these years, um, in whatever the indication is, maybe it is time to take a different approach. I mean, if your horse isn't going to cross the finish line, maybe change horses. Ooh, if your horse isn't going to cross the finish line, it's time to change horses. I don't know if it's ever been done at the Preakness, but uh, um, 
Uh, good thought. Um, all right, so going back to what I was saying before, um, we've seen startups who have had maybe one foot in each camp, right? Where they've said, look, we, we're a commercial endeavor. If you don't have funding, you don't have nothing. As in, if I, to paraphrase uh, the philosopher, uh, uh, Jeremy Kopp. Um, so they recognize that. And so their initial indication will be, you know, lower hanging fruit, right? Uh, a, a target that's uh, other people have been approved for. So if they're doing a 510K route, it's going to be easier to get FDA approval, right? Because, oh yeah, I can use such and such as my predicate. But what I really want to do, what I really want to do is address this unmet, big unmet need that's going to take many more years. So that's going in the pipeline. And so they have this two-pronged approach. One company I can think of, and granted, it's not a successful company, but North Star Neuroscience, right? When they initially came out, it wasn't their stroke rehab. That was in the, that was in the background. Oh no, we're going to do pain. They had a percutaneous um, uh, stimulation system, which I think still exists. RS Medical have then bought the rights from North Star. And that was just to help, you know, get them started commercially. Am I out of time? No, I'm good. Um, help them get started commercially, get some initial revenue, some relationships going. But what they really wanted to do was stroke. They got the investment community really interested in treating because it was an unmet need. Unfortunately, they accomplished just the opposite because of the failed trial, but that's another story. Uh, so we've seen another number of companies that have taken that approach, come out with the, with a, you know, try and do both, which is, I think, what, what, what Jeremy was trying to say. All right. Anyway, we've been blabbing on and uh, let's open it up to the audience to get some uh, input. Uh, Victor, did you have anything you, you wanted to add? Okay. Anyone else? Uh, who wants to address the issue. If you're a neurotech startup, are you better off, you know, coming up with a, a treating an indication that nobody else is out there treating, or are you better off going into an existing market where there's existing uh, uh, therapies? Any, any of the entrepreneurs, Richard, do you want to throw your two cents in on this? I'm forcing you to. So you, you <laughs> I'll try, but it's, uh, I think my advice for a startup would be um, don't unless you've got a burning need that you have to solve something. Otherwise, don't bother at all because the pain isn't just worth it unless you've got an absolute need to do it. Um, of the new tech out there, I think there is. Um, so the, the paid out of pocket route is um, and the data we gathered just recently, um, essentially currently dead. So if you're dealing with any chronic disease, um, people's willingness to pay out of pocket in the current environment, in a recessionary environment with people on, with chronic diseases on long-term fixed incomes in an inflationary environment, we just saw willingness to pay out of pocket just vanish. Mm. Um, and therefore, it's a reimbursement game in anything uh, pain or chronic. And therefore, it is what story you can you tell related to breakthrough status um, and fast tracks for reimbursement. So... I wouldn't like someone, I, if someone was going down a 10K route uh, for paid out of pocket, I'd be like, good luck getting money for that. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. We're going to hear from Richard in the next uh, uh, session, um, so you'll find out more about this. Uh, yeah. uh, Bob, I'm going to call on you because uh, Bob, chairman of the over the years, you've uh, probably witnessed uh, many startups, uh, many successful, a couple maybe not as successful. Um, you know, from from your standpoint of seeing, you know, these spinoffs from the foundation come and go, uh, how would you address that? So, you know, Al, Al Man had a uh, had a saying that you know you should go after some uh, either an unmet or a poorly met. Uh, medical need and so it it didn't really matter whether someone else was there if they weren't doing a good job at meeting the the clinical need then it then it made sense to you know be a quote, fast follower but uh but if no one was there um it was also worthwhile if you know if there's a real need uh you can create value by uh by going after that need so but you have to have enough patience which you know i think some of the as was, was alluded to i think when there weren't enough patients um it's uh, it's it's a bigger challenge. 
you're passing the microphone for a second and just say that I think that the other thing to consider is if you're already in a market that has some form of a solution, whether it's the best solution or not, chances are you're making an incremental improvement along the way and that you're not doing a beachhead therapeutic. And so it, that you have to determine that not only from a funding perspective, but from what motivates you. Are you, are you happy enough to just build a better mousetrap or do you want to go tame the jungle in general? Yeah, and I yeah. love my metaphors. Yeah, just to add to the conversation, for uh, our company, Pathmaker Neurosystems, we found that that we're going after indications that are currently being treated with pharmacological agents. And for and, and uh, for example, we're doing post-stroke spasticity and ALS disease progression. And in both cases, there really aren't great treatments out there. So we have a means to come in with a neuromodulatory approach that is safer, uh, could be uh, uh, a lot less costly, and in some cases more efficacious. So that's kind of just how we've, uh, how it's how it's played out for us. Great. Anyone else want to comment? <laughs> uh, some some of the couple items we today I think are are uh, relevant here. Um, the last talk yesterday was uh, bias uh, and and entering what we defined as pharma markets. And I, I think the fact that we label them pharma markets is in itself showing bias because if, if for example, you're talking about chronic pain, it's a chronic pain market, not a pharma market. And in fact, pharma uh, really lets a lot of those patients down. So I think as we think about opportunities, one of the challenges is how long are we willing to take on failed pharma treatments before we get to uh, an alternative, you know, neuromod treatment or otherwise, because time isn't just money, time is life for these patients, right? So if we can answer that, then I think some of these markets become a lot more viable and, and lucrative. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And since you mentioned time, I think we're out of time on this topic. Let's move on to the next topic, which is a similar one. New doctors to reach. Should neurotech firms try to reach a new core of clinicians who haven't yet uh, either prescribed or implanted neuromodulation therapies? Or is it better to reach out to a new group of uh, clinicians? Remember, clinicians are a key part uh, of the uh, distribution channel here, right? Um, in a lot of ways, you could think of them like a sales force. I mean, they're not. But, you know, without them, you ain't going to sell. Jeremy, you're first. So if you're talking about existing conditions, you know, let's take the, the SES market, very crowded. Uh, doctors already have uh, too many choices. And uh, how are you, if you're a new player, going to get into the market? So, you know, what was, uh, you know, I'll give you two examples. Nevro had a better mousetrap, at least, you know, that was what they were going after. Uh, and incredibly went up against uh, the big uh, uh, manufacturers and succeeded. But you know, you look at uh, Great Batch had a, a startup in the SES world, no startup, but a company, and it was more of a Me Too product, and it it folded. So very hard to get into new clinician uh, to existing clinicians with an existing product unless you have a much better mousetrap. Uh, new clinicians though are a challenge as well. Uh, training, you know, if it's an implantable device, training, you know, don't underestimate how expensive and how difficult it is to train uh, doctors and uh, how long it takes. You know, if if you're, we're, we're still dependent for implantables on cadaver labs, and so that's a major consideration, particularly for startups in terms of scaling. Uh, amount of time. So I, I think it's a, it's you have to be prepared for an uphill battle. It takes a lot. It's a, what is it? It takes a lot to change your plans and a train to change your mind. So if we're dealing with entrenched physicians who have a um, MO that works for them, it, it's a re-education process. I don't know how many of you have elderly parents or grandparents and, and teaching them a new technology. There are some that, you know, I'll, I'll be on a cruise and I'll see, you know, people, octogenarians going through and they're like, oh, hang on, I'm going to FaceTime my grandkids and great grandkids. And then my mother-in-law who sits at a phone and pokes at it like this, not everyone is going to be able to adapt. And so you have to uh, be able to design a sales 
flow that recognizes that from the beginning. And I think, you know, getting rheumatologists to write a referral to a neurosurgeon instead of a prescription is something that we're seeing in very real time. All right. It just says she'll be on a cruise. <laughs> She'll be on a cruise. <laughs> that's going to be most of her time. But that's, but that's beside the point. Let me throw my two cents in. A comment that our keynote speaker made yesterday that, that really resonated uh, with me, and, and we've seen this from experience. He said that doctors don't like to give up patients, right? Uh, and I mentioned uh, during my talk uh, about uh, the neural control. You know, one of the problems they had, aside from, you know, the fact that they were too early to, to treat this, this disorder, um, that the market wasn't ready for them yet, that the you know, clinician community, part of the problem was that they were going after the wrong clinician. Yeah, the neurosurgeons were happy to implant this device and to do the tendon transfer uh, and all that. But they didn't own the patient. <laughs> the PM&Rs owned the patient, and the PM&Rs were reluctant to, to to pass them on. And we've seen that in other uh, in other disciplines. Neuromodulation, by definition, is is a is a um, therapy that requires the coordination of many clinical specialties. There's no such thing as a neuromodulation doctor, right? You're going to have a neurologist, or you're going to have a neurosurgeon, or you're going to have an interventional anesthesiologist, or you're going to have an orthopedic surgeon, or you're going to have a urologist, or you're going to have a psychiatrist. So that's that's a challenge. I'm out of time. Jeremy? <clears throat> uh so I want to share one example where there is an opportunity for, for instance, SES, uh, where, you know, well, for, first of all, you know, my experience is that doctors always want more, more than one solution, uh, but they, you know, after two or three, it gets very difficult because of different techniques, because of inventory considerations, because different, uh, you know, uh, dealing with different reps and so forth. And, you know, back in the day of cochlear implants, I was there from day, from day one with advanced bionics, where there was only one competitor. Doctors were so eager to have an alternative, mm, but when all of a sudden there were three or four, it's like, no, no, we don't, I don't want any more. Um, so when it comes to implantable devices for pain, uh, you know, interventional anesthesiologists, they're pretty tapped out. You know, there's only a handful of neurosurgeons or you know, physiatrists uh, as well. But interventional radiologists is certainly a growing uh, target. And they're, they, they love interventional pain uh, and the penetration rate is, is very low. So, Jojo? So I think the other way to go after this, if we have recalcitrant physicians and clinicians that are unwilling to adapt to recalcitrant. new- Recalcitrant, I like that, I like that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Wordly Wise. Um, no, I mean, if we have a set of physicians that are resistant to adopting new opportunities for therapy, then you take the Viagra route, go direct it. Don't, I mean, it's a prescription, so that's not gonna affect, but if you advertise directly to a group of motivated patients, um, that push is is going to start coming from the from the patient to the physician and force them to say, okay, I have five five of my visits today said, why don't you look at why am I not a candidate for this? And and so you push instead of pull. That's good. I think next year we're going to have an award for called the Recalcitrant Physician Award, uh, but uh, I'm not sure that they're going to come in person to to accept that award. Apparently, not willingly. <laughs> they might. They might not be willing. All right. Uh, uh, my turn. I wanted to reference. There's a kind of. I don't want to say a raging debate, but there's a, an interesting back and forth going on on LinkedIn. I don't know how many of you are on LinkedIn, uh, but a number of pain. Uh, doctors who are members of INS or NANS, uh, 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 Dr. Hagedorn in particular. Jeremy, I think you're familiar with him, right? So he raised the question, hey, you know, should we be reaching out to try and get um, new implanters, new physicians, or, you know, should we be going after, uh, um, you know, existing implanters and try and get them to have multiple devices? And, and, and just, you know, I didn't participate in this, but just reading the, re the responses from some of these clinicians, there's one camp, and these are the doctors themselves, who say, yes, I want to have as many options as possible. I want to, I want to be able to implant Medtronic, and I want to be able to implant, you know, Abbott, and I want to be able to have Never, and I want to, you know, have this whole uh, many arrows in, you know, in my 
quiver. And then there's another group that say, no, 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 no. Because, you know, yeah, in theory, that sounds like a great approach, but in practice, um, we're a business and, and, you know, it costs money to learn uh, these different systems and to employ people, um, and, you know, and, and similarly from the, am I out of time? Damn, I thought I was, thought I was being fast. All right, Jeremy, your turn. Uh, w- one other real example in terms of, uh, you know, physicians and, and new technologies. Uh, we were talking a little bit yesterday about in, uh, the new, the new implantable headache company, Sheratronics was uh, certainly referenced. Uh, and you know, this is an interesting device in ter- from a clinician perspective because uh, you know, year- years ago, you know, I was involved with uh, the headache trials at Advanced Bionics. All of them failed from the, all the big companies and neurologists completely discounted implantable solutions. You know, fast forward 20 years, they're now, you know, first of all, embracing the non- non-invasive and now the, uh, the implantable devices. But the challenge is, well, neurologists outside of a handful who are actually also uh, interventional anesthesiologists, they don't do procedures. So trying to pair that, and you mentioned this, Jim, in terms of uh, combined, you know, neurologists own the patients, but they now have to deal with a doctor, such as a, a neurosurgeon or interventional or pain a doctor for the procedure. So you know, these are just the real, real challenges in terms of uh, working with some of these clinicians, particularly in devices that span across multiple uh, physicians. Okay. We need to move on. Let's see if there's any comments from people in the room or uh, anyone on Zoom who wants to participate in this discussion? No. Okay. Anyone in the room? Yes, we've got uh, Eugene. Hi, I just want to just uh, touch base something that Georgia was mentioning about patients advocating for themselves um, and kind of putting pressure on physicians. Uh, in, in my I uh, right to try act. Mm. And what the issues of the right to try act was trying to do was relieve the pressure of liabilities on physicians and manufacturers. And maybe that would relieve some pressure to actually let, uh, make them be more open to let these therapies happen. But I, you know, in my research it was mainly focused to drugs and not devices. And maybe we need to think about, you know, who's advocating on our behalf in order to kind of change the language to maybe make it more applicable to our, our field. Thanks. All right. Anyone else who wants to comment? Uh, Victor. Yeah, I was good. I mentioned that, but uh, in addition to reaching out to new surgeons, we can also consider reaching out to new Say Metronic sacral nerve modulation is currently performed at hospitals. Right. And when Exonics came on market, they went to ambulatory centers and were able to reach completely no. So they didn't cut into the pie of Metronic. They created their new market, essentially. Excellent point. Uh, and Victor, uh, kind of off the subject, but when we talk about uh, reimbursement, uh, you know, it turns out there's different rates for whether you're implanting the same device at an ASC or at a hospital. And it turns out that the FDA has different regulations uh, about do you need prior authorization? Well, you do for an SCS system uh, if you're doing it in a hospital, but not if you're doing it at an ASC. So anyway, interesting point that you brought up. All right, time for maybe one more comment before we change topics. Seeing none, let's move on to the third topic, new ways to pay. Um, so let's answer, let's uh, let's address this question, uh, which is: Are neurotech firms too dependent on CMS reimbursement? Should we, you know, should we be looking for other forms of uh, uh, revenue models? Uh, Jeremy, do you want to start? So there are other alternatives, but they are very challenging uh, from both a commercialization and also from a valuation perspective. So you know, uh, some of the alternatives. Uh, uh, Tibic Health, for instance, has a wonderful uh, device that's non-invasive for sinusitis, uh, and you know they are doing a direct-to-consumer at a reasonable price. So that's certainly one model. Uh, but you know they're an IPO-traded company. You can buy the entire company today for about uh, 16 million. But I think it's very promising as their revenues will scale. Uh, when I was at Vianess, this was before they had. Uh, uh, CMS uh, in you know private payers paying where they uh, financed it you know they brought in a financing uh, a firm and you know made it an affordable monthly rate and they were able to scale considerably through that until they got a, a, you know the CMS um, and then 
uh, oh, when I was at Advanced Bionics, there was a foundation that was set up uh, and money was attracted into that foundation. They paid for cochlear implants. So, you know, for patients that needed it. But overall, without CMS, it's going to, you know, it, that you got to chase the money. And without CMS, you know, from a, a commercialization perspective, very hard, uh, you know, if you, if you have outside you know, funding to uh, get a, a high market cap. Georgia? I think without getting into the, the paintball wars of how messed up the healthcare system is, I think we have to recognize, um, to Richard's point, going after an out-of-pocket uh, solution is we're all doing that anyway, even with CMS codes, because the patient, arguably whether their insurance is paid for by their employer or if they're a small business and they pay their own freight on their insurance, those premiums and those deductibles that they've calculated or put paid into before they even get to an SCS system is still significant. I mean, you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars in those three categories of, of premium uh, copay and, and deductible before you even get to a surgical solution or an implanted solution. Um, so unless your price point is something below your average monthly grocery budget, mm. I don't even even CMS codes don't don't help out as much as we really think that they do, and and I don't think you can survive without them. Now, when you say average monthly <clears throat> gross uh, rebudget, are you talking about Whole Foods, or, or are you talking about grocery whole, outlet? Whole, whole paycheck grocery outlet. It, it doesn't. I mean, it's all relative, right? I mean, you your grocery budget scales. You know, you shop where your budget allows. Okay, so right. it's relative. All right. Um, you know, so my my thought on this are kind of similar to what we mentioned in the previous topic, uh, uh, which is we've seen companies with one foot in each camp, right? So we've seen companies, uh, particularly in the digital health uh, domain. In fact, one of the first was Posit Neuroscience, a company founded by Mike Marisnik, um, where it's like, hey, our first product is going to be consumer. We don't need FDA approval. We don't have to worry about reimbursement. And uh, then in the pipeline, we'll have, you know, a medical product that, that we're going to develop. And a lot of firms uh, have decided to go this route, the consumer slash wellness. I think it's called 513G exemption that you can get if to, to basically demonstrate to the FDA that, hey, we're not making a medical claim. We don't need we don't need no stinking FDA approval. Right. But um then in the pipeline, they're working on a version of the product, and maybe it's got other hardware components, maybe it's got other software components that does treat a medical condition, but that's going to take longer, uh, and that's going to require uh, reimbursement. So uh, again, it's kind of the two-pronged strategy that may work, or it may fail, and we've seen examples of both. Jeremy? <laughs> so at 1030, there, we have a discussion on, on CMS, uh, and... And, and, you know, in reimbursement and, you know, it'll be a good one because we're looking at you know, recent CMS decisions uh, and there are some winners and some losers uh, on the non-invasive side. And that, you know, directly impacts certainly their, uh, how they're planning, gonna sell forward in terms of how they're gonna scale in terms of their, you know, valuation. Uh, and so it, uh, you don't want to miss that uh, discussion. We've been plugging uh, that session. Yeah, we, we it, I hope it lives up to the uh, advanced billing. But uh, and um, so uh, you know, it, it, CMS really does impact so much, so so many areas of your business. Uh, because obviously, at the end of the day, you need to make revenue if you're you know beholden to to, to investors and you're not a, a nonprofit or you know funded by a family foundation where you don't have to have that certain considerations all right we're almost out of time do we have any comments from folks in the room who want to keep cutting me off i keep getting left out of my lap all, so all right all right you go ahead you are in the room because i'm a petulant child um no <laughs> you're a think... calcitrant that's what you are I think one of the other opportunities, because I'd love to ask Amy Cruz or APVC, you know, what they're, are they going to invest in something where you can't show a path to reimbursement? So maybe let's also look at how we can change the reimbursement model, especially mm. as we're looking at indications whose specialists are going to start retiring and not be backfilled by new um, practitioners. So if we can make the case for CMS to start looking at the healthcare economics, not just in terms of does it save money today based on what the standard of care is, but does it fulfill 
the need of a diminishing number of clinicians and providers. So psychiatry is a great point. We're not going to have enough psychiatrists to, to treat the increasing number of psychiatric disorders. So if we're demonstrating a solution that maybe is the same price, but is scalable, that's an opportunity where I think we can win. Hey, anyone from the audience? Anyone on Zoom who wants to comment on this? Uh, yes, All right. We have time for one comment, and it's Richard. Uh, just just on the paid out of pocket bit, um, I, we've been warned quite a few times about how much of a trap it, it could potentially be because um, if you've done your clinical trials on the version that is out as a consumer version, um, we've been warned that, hey, expect in the future, if you're trying to get claim reimbursement on a next gen, to actually have to prove clinical um, benefit of the next gen over the one that you've actually released as a as your as your paid out of pocket version and that's a really nasty little trap that we're trying to avoid mm -hmm. uh thanks richard and uh that concludes our um editorial roundtable i want to thank our um uh, eloquent <laughs> um uh contributors here jeremy and jojo and i want to thank you all who participated to the discussion